are red states doing a very poor job of responding to the coronavirus, whereas blue states, which tend to be very much more authoritarian, much more so uh, on the, the stance of making through, uh, through the law, through the blunt force of law, mandates for masks, shutdowns, all of those things. I mean, California still hasn't technically reopened. They've reopened some things, but they've stayed largely closed since March. One of the things that they're using to peddle this is the fact that there has been a massive increase in spikes, specifically in southern states, Republican-controlled states, and that is true. You can actually look at this graphic right here and see. Now, you'll see there on this list of states, these are sorted by the cases per population. So this isn't even raw numbers. This is per population. This is adjusted. So your small states and your large states have a fair, even playing ground to be compared on. And look at the list. Louisiana, Arizona, Florida. So you have to get all the way to number four, New York, before you even get to a blue state. And then after that, Mississippi, New Jersey, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and then Rhode Island, which is, is blue, and then District of Columbia, which is blue, but, you know, it's, it's a city, Massachusetts, then Nevada, then Tennessee, then Texas. Okay, that, that's a lot of red states. That's quite a few Republican states, that states primarily in the South that have big Republican majorities. Now, Arizona, it just kind of leans Republican. Georgia has been leaning Republican recently. But it is 100% fair to say that the vast majority of those states that have the largest case numbers per population, a lot of those states are red states. And so it's not that this is based off of absolutely nothing, but let's dig into the numbers and see if what they're saying is actually true. Here's the problem with all of that you would have to completely ignore the spikes in California in order to run with this narrative. Now, California, you may notice, was not on that list. And why is that? Because California is one of our largest states, one of our most populated states, and so it takes a much longer time for their spikes to show up because they have a larger population. So if you're looking at total per population, per capita, it takes a longer time for California to move up on that. The four that you hear mentioned the most when you're talking about spikes in cases, Arizona, Texas, California, Florida. Out of those four, which have had the most notable spikes, three of them border states, California, Arizona, Texas. This is another thing that people are not talking about, is that a lot of coronavirus cases are popping up specifically around the border. And interestingly enough, the policy now is you cannot immigrate into the United States unless you have coronavirus, which also makes no sense. Let me, let me play this out for you. If you're somebody that is a legal immigrant that has your papers, that has done the paperwork, and you want to come through the border legally, you actually can't do that right now because, because of the virus, there's been a pause on that. However, if you come across and you have coronavirus and do so illegally, to get free health care, they have to care for you. So literally the only people coming across the border right now in the border states are actually people that do have the coronavirus. Now, maybe there are some illegal immigrants slipping through that just don't have it, but it's also important to remember that currently Mexico, the amount of people that they are testing versus the amount of people that are being confirmed is somewhere last I saw in the 40 percentile. So this thing is running rampant through Mexico right now. And the people that are coming across the border largely are those that are infected with coronavirus or have just come from, or even if they don't, they're coming from a country where it's rampant, so they're more likely to have it even if they don't realize that they have it yet. So, I mean, when you look at this, I mean, that's just a, a perfect storm. Now, Florida doesn't have that problem. Florida spikes are unconnected to that. But those other three states the border does play a pretty significant factor in the spikes that they're seeing. Also, you would need to consider this graph here. This is the total cases per population, but the bottom 15. So let's look at these states. North Dakota, that's a red state. Missouri, that's traditionally a red state. 
kind of purplish, but, but usually red. Ohio, that's a swing state. Washington, definitely blue. Kentucky, red state. Wyoming, red state. New Hampshire, blue state. Oregon, blue state. Alaska, red state. Montana, red state. West Virginia, West Virginia is not only a red state. It is second only to the state of Alabama in its approval rating of Donald Trump in the last poll. I think in Alabama, Donald Trump's approval rating is 63%, and in West Virginia, it's like 61, 62. In fact, West Virginia and Alabama actually switch back and forth, usually, on who likes Trump the most. So, West Virginia is not just a red state, it's an extremely red state. And then, Maine, Vermont, and Hawaii, all of which are blue states. So, if you're looking at the bottom 15, it's a pretty healthy blend got several blue states, several red states. Well, if this was just mismanagement by the red states, why do we have a whole bunch of red states that are in the bottom 15 as well? And also it's important to note that in some of the states that we just looked at, North Dakota, Montana, when you're looking at some of those Mountain West states, they have very low numbers despite the fact that their governors were one of the most hands-off out of all of the states. Governor Ivey's approach has been way more hands-on and way more in favor of things like mask mandates and shutdowns than Montana or North Carolina's, or North Carolina, uh, North Dakota's governors have been. So if the problem or the, the X factor here are shutdowns and mandates and how hands-on the governors are, that list really doesn't make sense that you've got a whole bunch of red states that did actually uh, were actually freer and did a more libertarian, laissez-faire kind of approach to the virus than a lot of the red states that are at the top of the list. So how do you sync all that? How does all of that make sense? Well, there's a couple of different factors that I think have a lot to do with it. First of all, a lot of those states like the Dakotas, like Montana, very, very sparsely populated, and that makes it a lot harder for the virus to spread. Inherently, regardless of who was in charge, regardless of political party, that would be true no matter what. But here's the other thing. Do you notice that all of the red states that were in the top 15 are southern states? Every single one of them. They are southern states that have a very warm climate. See, I was hopeful, and you may remember that I actually said this on the show, that the intense heat in the South that would come in the summer would actually kill the virus off, but it seems as though it actually helped facilitate it. Not because heat is good for the virus, but because when it's 100 degrees outside, people tend to stay indoors and not go outside. And because of that, and they tend to congregate, they're in air conditioning all day, which actually makes the virus easier to spread as opposed to the more mild, and we actually had a very mild spring this year that we were having earlier in the year. So part of the reason that you're seeing an awful lot of the southern states, including Alabama on that top 15 when it comes to cases versus population, probably has a lot to do with that. I don't think it's a mistake that Arizona is also in the top 15, and then you've got Montana and Alaska in the bottom 15 despite being red states as well. The determining factor is not whether a governor is a Republican or a Democrat when it comes to this. It has a lot more to do with geography and the natural conditions surrounding these states than the political makeup of it. That's simply the truth. This also gives a great deal of insight because we've been looking at total cases. Now let's look at total deaths because that gives us a very different picture of who is handling the virus well and who isn't. These are total deaths, again, adjusted for population, courtesy of World Meter. So let's look at the top 15 states when it comes to deaths per population. New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. We haven't hit a red state yet. These are solid, solid blue states. Now we finally get to a red state, Louisiana. And then it's District of Columbia, Michigan, Illinois, then Mississippi. So we got to get all the way down to Mississippi to even get another red state. And then it's Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, then Arizona and Indiana. So out of those top 15, we had four red states. And they weren't even near the top. On the stat that really matters, whether or not people actually died, the blue states have way more deaths. It's not even close. 
And a lot of that does have to do with their demographics. It has to do with the fact that they have larger, more population-dense populations. But, I, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're trying to make this into a red or a blue state media, the blue states are losing by a lot. It's not even close. So I would be careful about playing this game. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the, new, the, the biggest population center in New England, New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo, is a complete and utter dunce that completely destroyed his state when it came to this. If New York were a country, if you counted it as a country instead of a state, he would have one of the highest death rates of any country on planet Earth. It wouldn't even be close. And if it were its own country, and you were to lift New York and their stats out of the United States, United States would actually be a lot better when it came to deaths versus population on the international stage. We would move from like, I think we were 13th or 14th last I checked, we would move all the way down to like 50th. And so New York in and of itself, because of people like Comrade Bill de Blasio and Andrew Cuomo, they by themselves through mismanagement and actually sending people with coronavirus into the most deadly place that they could go, nursing homes, caused a lot more deaths than even their European counterparts. Where the virus was way worse and showed up earlier where they had less time to prepare. And so the idea that mismanagement of Republican governors is causing problems for people. No, people like Andrew Cuomo have literal blood on their hands because of this. Sending COVID-positive people into nursing homes. Now, I've been pretty darn critical of our governor. And I've been critical of several other Republican governors for making decisions that I thought were not smart. But nothing they have done even compares to that. That is arguably the worst thing that you could do. I, I mean, other than just having people walking around, finding elderly people with pre-existing conditions and specifically trying to infect them, I don't think that you could do any worse than sending COVID positive people and saying legally they can't, they're not even allowed to take someone that tested positive for the virus and ask them not to come into a nursing home. By the way, another thing that you may uh, also be interested in, because Andrew Cuomo keeps trying to trot this out, that he has lower nursing home deaths than several other states. You also have to keep in mind that if somebody was in a nursing home and got it because of Andrew Cuomo's stupid law, and then they went to the hospital, they don't count that as a nursing home death. Unless the person actually died within the four walls of the nursing home, they say that's not a nursing home death. Even if they know for a fact that they contracted it in a nursing home, doesn't matter. The state of New York doesn't count that as a nursing home death. So don't let them peddle this lie. It's absolutely insane that they're now trying to make the case that people like Andrew Cuomo handled it right, and you've got red state governors like Ron DeSantis or Brian Kemp that are botching it. No, that is not going to fly. The numbers don't even come close to bearing that out. Now, remember that another thing that may be a contributing factor here is that when did New England see their spikes? Well, they saw them very early on. Their spikes happened at the beginning of this thing. Well, what was also true at the beginning of all this? Testing wasn't readily available. The tests weren't all that accurate. We, you know, we did the best that we could, and it was a situation that was brand new, but the testing capabilities that we have now, they just didn't exist when they hit their spikes. Which also means that there are probably an awful lot of people that actually did get the coronavirus and didn't know it back when all of this was taking place. Now that we have much more robust testing and more reliable testing, a lot of that is showing up. So if you have two locations one that had a spike where testing wasn't readily available, and another one that their spike came after testing was widespread and everybody that wanted to get a test could get a test, well then, of course, by percentage of population, the place that 
had their spike during a time where testing was much more robust, that place is, of course, going to show up as having more. That stands to reason. Because even if they had the exact same number, it, let, let's say it were two places with the exact same population, with the exact same numbers, the exact same demographics, everything, one had their spike early, one had their spike late, if you look at the numbers, of course it's going to seem as though location number two had way more because their spike came at a time where everybody that wanted to get a test could get a test. That's what you're seeing now. I'm not saying it's the only factor, but it's a big factor when it comes to comparing it to places like New York and New Jersey that had their spikes very, very early on when we didn't have as much testing capability. That does make a pretty big difference. Let's look at the spikes in Texas, Arizona, and Florida, since these are the states that Democrats are constantly ragging and saying are not handling this well. So if you're looking at these spikes and looking at the timeline here, you may notice something interesting, that you started to see an increase in numbers when the lockdown started, and remember, this is a combination of Arizona, Florida, and Texas per million. So this is adjusted for population. So at the very beginning, you see an increase. After an increase, you see a lockdown. And then reopenings happen, and the line stays pretty much flat. And then you get to the protest, and cases skyrocket. Now, deaths remain roughly the same. There is a slight increase in deaths you can see at the end of that chart but not a giant one, certainly not one that coincides with the massive explosion of cases per million in Texas, Arizona, and Florida. Now, does this definitively prove that the protests that happened in reaction to the death of George Floyd are the cause of the cases? No, I don't think that you can make that case. You can't definitively say that, oh, well, look, that happened right after the protest. Could they have been a factor? I think so, actually but not because there were a whole bunch of people gathering outside. I think it has a lot more to do with the fact that, A, you've got a whole bunch of people that are now scared of the protest and now congregating together and not leaving their home, or B, it could be something uh, that's a combination of that and how the media handled it very cavalier, and now people are going out and interacting with one, of people, with one another because they're seeing video of crowds in the streets and the same media that was telling them to be afraid of their own chatter is, shadow is now saying, we commend these people for their bravery and going out there and not worrying about the virus and risking their lives and all this other stuff. They're like, oh, well, this is the same people that were telling me that I was going to die of this, even if I'm 25 and never had a health condition in my life then I guess it's okay to go outside. And so they went out and interacted with one another and got the virus. I'm not saying for sure I know that happened, but you can't tell me that that wasn't at least a part of the psychological math going on here when all of this took place. I think that had way more of an effect than people actually catching the virus at the protest. I don't think that that probably happened all that often because it happened largely outside. Maybe a few people did, probably not a lot. And so that played a much bigger factor in all of this. So maybe in that way, the protests did contribute to the rise in cases. But what it does definitively show, regardless of whether protests played a role in it, it does definitively show that the ending of the lockdowns, in other words, the reopening, that wasn't the catalyst. This thing has an incubation period of two weeks. That's a gap of two months. There is no way that the reopenings were the cause of this. And you'll see on that chart, if, if you're looking at that timeline, you've got a two-month gap between when a lot of these people were reopening and the cases actually started going up, which would leave a reasonable, rational person that doesn't have a dog in the fight to look at that data and go, huh, reopenings must have not had anything to do with it. The government shutdowns simply do not work. Every bit of data bears that conclusion out. Furthermore, if we're going to compare it to a blue state, in other words, we're going to compare the mismanaged red states to blue states, let's go ahead and look at a comparison of those three states to New York. So you'll see there that the dotted line are cases, the solid line is deaths. And the blue one there, New York, not only do they have a gigantic spike much larger than the combined cases per population of Arizona, Florida, and Texas, and of course it's earlier as well, 
you'll also notice that their deaths coincide very clearly with their cases. Not so in those other three states. In the other three states, you have an increase in death, sure. It does not rise at the same rate that their case rate does. And so New York is literally the worst case scenario. In fact, if you were to compare this with one of the early models that we saw, you remember that we saw everybody, it was, it was everywhere. I used it on this show. The whole flatten the curve model. New York looks like the worst case scenario from that model. And Arizona and Texas and Florida, they all look like the flatten the curve model. They do hit a spike later on, which is a lot bigger than it was initially, but that's because they did a good job of that and it didn't result in more deaths. This narrative that they're trying to put out there, that red states are just botching this and Democrat uh, mayors and governors are doing a fantastic job, there's simply no data that backs that up. You just dig into the data just a little bit and it shows that that narrative has absolutely nothing to it. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.